Good morning. Can you all hear me? No? I can talk loudly, but, you know, there we go. I think we're coming on now. Hello, hello, hello. Are we good now? Yes. Awesome. Well, I'm excited to be with you today. Let me just get situated here. I think I got a little cord tangled. This happens every time. All right, I've asked a friend of mine, Evan, to come up and play um, because I feel like God is going to continue um, to have us go down this road of uh, becoming a revolutionary today. Um, while he's getting set up, I just want to pray for you. Is that okay before we get started? Lord Jesus, we give you permission to perform heart surgery with the anesthesia of the Holy Spirit's help. <laughs> Lord, that you would come in and you would touch each heart sitting here today. Father, I ask that you would, even right now, drown out all of the noise, all of the clutter, all the distraction. And Father, that we would be able to see you this morning and to see you rightly. Father, just invite you here. God, I just pray that you would even now begin to break off heaviness, even now that you'd begin to break off weariness, Father. Lord, that you would even speak to the mothers in the room. If you're a mom, put your hand over your heart. We break off any um, shame and heaviness or the lie of the enemy where you say, I'm so sorry that my kids have a mother like me. We break that off right now. In Jesus' name, I want to remind you something. You are a mom because the Lord ordained it, and he knew you could do it, and he knew that you would invest in your children's lives like no other, no other soul in the world could do. So we just break off that shame right now. We break it off and replace it with the promise of the Father that he gave you these children on purpose just like he selected Mary to, to carry Jesus. He selected you. And we just break off the lie of the enemy that says it's so easy for all the other moms. Everybody else has it together, and I just don't. We just break it off in Jesus' name. We're all human. We're all trying. And the Lord has given you grace, and he's working beside you. So, Father, we just break off discouragement and heaviness right now. In Jesus' name. Let's stay here. Let's stay in this place. I wasn't planning on doing that, but I just felt like the Lord was wanting to say something to moms today. Mm. And I feel like he's going to continue to speak to you throughout this whole sermon. Dads too. But specifically lifting off the heaviness um, that a lot of moms carry. Mm. This is going to be good. So Pastor Steve has been preaching on probably my favorite series that he's ever done called The Love Evolution. And it's not just because it's fun to say love evolutionary. But today we're going to continue. So what is the love evolution? Well, if you remember the last time I spoke on this, the Lord interrupted my sermon prep with my son, who gave me a prophetic word in his way. Um, and the Lord continued to speak kind of in the same vein, so I'm excited to go deep with you. So you're going to probably take a deep breath. We're going to go very deep today, I hope. So what is the evolution? It's returning to the simplicity of the gospel. It's reminding ourselves that before Christianity was marketed as a path to a better life, before Christianity was just a method to greater success or our secret sauce, you know what I mean? Like we have the kingdom of God on our side and Jesus is fighting for us and our life is so much better because of him. I wanna take us back to the roots because all those things are true, but at the heart of it, it's not the root of Christianity. We don't join the kingdom because of temporal gain. We don't join into our relationship with Jesus just because he makes our life better, although he does. And just because um, we have a plumb line to heaven, we have wisdom that we can release into the earth. Whoa. I don't know what that is. Is that real distracting? 
If that's you, Holy Spirit, we receive it. If it's not, not today, devil. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a posture, what we're trying to do. This revolutionary, I almost want to like verb it and say that it's a posture that we can, that we give ourselves, not because of the great things that we get from him, but because, because somehow we've caught a glimpse of the Father. Somehow we've caught a glimpse of Jesus and and we saw him. I don't know how he revealed himself to you. I'm not sure if he revealed himself to you when, when somebody was preaching a message or if the Lord spoke through a melody in music or if he spoke to you when you were on vacation and you were looking at something beautiful like the ocean or mountain, but somewhere, somehow, the Lord touched your heart. He reached in and he said, this is who I am. Let me show you who you are. The Lord touched your heart in a personal way. And for that reason, we were moved and we were wowed, not because of really great musicianship, not because of really great lighting or smoke machines or lights. It's because the message that has captivated the world for thousands of years still carries the same amount of weight this morning on November 28th that it did when it was preached on the day of Pentecost. The message never loses its power. It never loses its steam. So often we hear messages and we, th- we, we see things that encourage us and things we get excited about, but there is a shelf life on those things. You can be excited about your promotion. You can be excited about who you're marrying and who you're married to. You can be excited about that new house you're buying or that new, that great dream that's coming into fruition. But the truth is all of those things are temporary. None of them last. If you're 80 and you're saying, do you remember when I was 19 and I got this great entry level job at a company I was hoping to get at? Nobody says that. Maybe some. But the truth is, all of those things are temporary and this message never loses its weight or its power. Let me tell you, if we ever get tired about hearing about the good news that we were all heading to an eternity of separation from Jesus, we were all never going to be able to make it, but then God in his infinite wisdom and knowledge planned before the foundation of the earth, because he knew we wouldn't be able to cut it. We weren't gonna be able to cross the chasm that sin would create between us and him. So he sacrificed his son and resurrected him from the grave so that we could live a connected life where the presence that we're enjoying right now in this room, it's not some ethereal, gaseous thing that makes us feel good. It is him. It is Jesus. It is his presence. And so when you get moved in worship, when you experience him in this morning, it is a freedom and it is a liberty that didn't come without cost. It was paid at the highest price, which means that you are valuable to him. And this message, if it doesn't move us, if it doesn't shake us, if it doesn't stir us up to think about that, then somehow we've depersonalized the message. We've, we've gotten away from it and we've allowed Christianity to comfortably fit into our lives, into a pocket and a rhythm that works for us. But I wanna tell you something, it was never designed for that. The beauty of this revolution is that it is not convenient. It's not meant to be easy. It's not meant to be something that we, that we just say, yes, I'm saved and I'm on the revolutionary road and everything is easy now. It's just not biblical. But you know what it says in the word? It says Psalms 34, 18, that he's near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. This morning during worship, I felt like I wanted to remind the Lord. Have you ever wanted to remind the Lord of something? (laughs) It's like, Lord, do you remember? (laughs) What a question. He knows everything. I love how tolerant he is with me. I said, I wanted to remind him this morning during worship. This is something that when I feel like I cross through, Pastor Steve likes to talk about this, talks about being in the courtyard and moving into the inner courts of the presence of the Lord till you get into the glory, right? Well, I was making my way through that path, you know, through praise and thanksgiving into his presence, delighting it, and then pressing into that holy place. And I just had the simple thought kind of crystallize in my mind. And I thought, Lord, I want you to know that if you never did another wonderful thing for me, as long as I live, I am overflowing. 
I am satisfied by you. That there's no riches or notoriety or delights this side of heaven that can compete with the sound of your voice. This is where the human language fails us because we say the sound as if it's an audio, a message that we hear with our ears, but when the Lord speaks to you, when he speaks, it's almost like our DNA stands at attention, right? There's something inside of us that recognizes that this is my maker, this is the architect of my soul. And when he speaks to me, something on the inside of me begins to be moved because my, my body, my composition on a cellular level recognizes that when that voice is speaking, it is the same voice that formed me, the same voice that holds me all together and the same voice I will return to at the conclusion of this side of heaven. When he speaks, the reason why you're moved is because you're made up of his words. Your physical body is made up of his words. He breathed his spirit into you, his life into you. And then in your mind here, you're made up of his words. Everything that, that you could think about yourself that's in alignment with heaven, he put there and he said, this is who you are. This is who you are. So many of us sitting here today, you've had so many lies spoken over your life. You've had so many people tell you, you're never gonna make this, you're never gonna be able to do this, but I'm here to tell you that we're not defined by somebody else and what they say. Because guess what? They're made up of his words too. His word is the one that matters. So today, my message is titled, The Path of the Revolutionary. So, hmm, yes, Lord, sorry, he's speaking to me. This is becoming a revolutionary. It, when I was in high school, I was a distance runner, AKA masochist. <laughs> Any long distance runners in the house today? Can I see your hands? Yes, Lord help you, <laughs> delivery. <laughs> We must like it, right? No, nobody knows the secret that after you run like 60 miles in a week, that there's this like incredible buoyancy that takes over your mind and your body. Your body releases all these feel good chemicals and you feel like amazing after you're running that long. But it, it man, it takes a long time to get there. Anyways, when I was in high school, I used to run 60 to 70 miles a week. Um, pretty competitive, really wanted to be good at it. And we had this big stretch of acres of woods that was close by the school. Um, it was largely untouched, pretty much deserted. Anytime that you went there, you, you probably maybe see a handful of people, but they, they were just so big. They expanded past the school and like all throughout the whole community. There was like eight different entry points you can get into these woods. It was huge. And um, just greenery after greenery, there's paths that would um, take you for half a mile all the way around and there would just be beautiful trees and water. And, and um, there was a creek, uh, I think it was a creek, carried through the whole woods and it was just, it was beautiful. If you ran there at night or if, you, you know, before sunset because you weren't allowed to, I never ran at night. I did. Um, but my most favorite time to go would be in the morning before the sun, right after the sun had risen. So when you'd run, even the animals were still asleep and you could see, uh, like every so often you see a big owl that hadn't gone down to sleep. Um, big gray snowy owl. Um, Anyway, so there would be paths that you would run, but once you get familiar with these woods, um, you started to kind of identify these little rabbit trails. And when you got to the rabbit trails, if you didn't know where they were, you'd probably just walk right by them, but it's almost like you discovered a secret in the woods. And you get to this little path, and it's not even necessarily a road. I mean, once you get deep, there's roots and stones, and it's a very narrow path, and it feels like if you look to your left or your right, nothing but woods all around you, right? But these paths are invisible to the naked eye. You have to know where they are. And so what I felt like the Lord told me is he reminded me of all that. I gave you that whole picture because he said the last time that I spoke to you about becoming a revolutionary, and I felt like the Lord wanted us to just simply state what the good news is and the gospel is and the message of Jesus. 
I felt like the Lord said, Jay, you could keep on going to this beautiful path. You could keep running forward um, and I'll show you some amazing things to share where you have the opportunity to go deeper down this road, deeper down this path into who Jesus is. And I thought that we should take that path today. Sound good? Good. Mm. So becoming a revolutionary, it's a path that leads off the main road. It's an invitation from the Father towards us to continue on and venture deeper. I'm calling it the revolutionary road. It's so fun to say. But it's not a fancy new formula or a way to live. It is a return. It's coming back home. It is a worn and weathered and narrow path. And he is the path. Jesus is the path. It says in Matthew 7, 13 through 14, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. This is the revolutionary road. The path forged by the life of Jesus that leads us back to the Father. So if, if you follow the life of Jesus, every recorded word, habit, and decision will lead back to the Father. He said over and over again that he only did what he saw the Father doing. He was in perfect unity with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And this is where he is right now, currently. This is where Jesus is. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you right now. He forged the path for you and for me that if we follow him, we will be led to the Father. So Christian actually means imitator of Christ. So if we are Christians and we're attempting to copy and imitate the way that Jesus lived, not just his teachings, but the rhythms of how he lived and what he did in the margins of his time, in between the sermons, he would disappear to pray all night. After his teachings, he would send the disciples before him and spend the night alone in the mountains talking to his father and then walking on water to catch up later. You see, that's, that's the revolutionary road here. If he is the path, then I think that we can't just focus in on the sermons and the parables and the teachings, although we need to internalize all of that as it is the word of God. But it's in the margins, kind of identifying how did Jesus live his life? Because he was on the earth for 33 years as, as fully God and fully man. 33 years. And look what he did in three years of ministry. How did he live the rhythms of his life? And are we, as Christians, are we attempting to live by just the principles and the ideals, or are we trying to model our life after what Jesus did and how he lived his? It says, when Jesus uh, saw a great multitude, he was moved with compassion and healed their sick. It said it again, that he saw multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. So how do we identify this path? How do we discover this in the greenery? How do we become the revolutionary we were meant to be and walk down this road and this path? It's recognizing what moved him, why he performed miracles in the context of when they happened. One of my favorite things that the Lord's been speaking to me about is how he loves to speak during interruptions. Have you ever had a word from God that felt like an interruption? I hope so. So there's so many different examples in the Bible about when God spoke during interruptions, but I can tell you from personal experience that my most favorite, most incredible jaw-dropping moments with the Lord were in moments where I was not expecting him to speak. It wasn't when I was trying to fit him comfortably into a, a track or a rhythm or a box in my life. It was when I was interrupted by him and I responded to that interruption. Now, the biggest test that you can put yourself to this is if you are a parent, how do you respond when your kids interrupt you? 
Everybody here is just looking at me. I don't know if it's the music that I'm setting, or, um, which is beautiful, by the way, Evan. It's wonderful. Um, but I think most of you, if your kids approach you, you're probably uh, full of grace and never lose your temper and never snap. That's what I think. <laughs> it's because when you get interrupted, when your agenda gets shifted, when someone takes you away from what you're doing or that precious article you're reading on your phone that was very important, it's a heart revealer, right? Because I think what I'm trying to get at here is why are interruptions so telling? Because interruptions indicate if you are being present and connected in your life. If your mind is always somewhere else, if you are on, on this, this little device, I won't call it an idol today, I did in previous messages, but if your eyes are trained on this screen and you're looking at this all the time, or if you're never present in the moment, you're worried about the past, you're trying to plan for the future, then of course when someone interrupts you with something in the present, you're not gonna be open to it. But why are interruptions important? Why does God like to speak through them? It's because God loves to interrupt, to reveal to us where our hearts hearts are at. Because if we are connected to him in every present moment, like the word says, to pray without ceasing, to keep our eyes fixated on Jesus, and when we're interrupted by him, it should just be like a, a breath, a tap on the shoulder, that he's walking beside you and say, oh Lord, what were you going to say? Not, I'm busy, or I need to focus on this, or this immediate thing that is so important that I won't even remember in two weeks. It takes precedence over what you're trying to say. So hold on one second, Lord. I need to focus on what I need to do, and then I'll turn around and you can speak to me. That's how often sometimes when we get interrupted and we wonder why we're not hearing from him and we wonder why we feel like the words are sparse. It's because maybe our lives are on a track and a trajectory running at a different pace than maybe sometimes he's speaking. Interruptions are beautiful because they give you the opportunity to ask yourself this question. Am I connected in my life? Am I connected in this present moment where the Lord is? Because you can see him in the past and you can prophesy and look to the future, but you cannot touch his heart in the past or in the future. You can only do it right now. And that's why it's so important to live connected. And you can look at what Jesus did. He got interrupted a lot. A lot of these miracles that we, that we read and we study were interruptions. So um, the woman with the issue of blood, total interruption. The lame man lowered through the roof, he was teaching a sermon. Blind Bartimaeus screaming in the streets, he was on a journey. Calming the sea, even worse, he was napping and got interrupted. Jairus' 12-year-old daughter, interruption. Jesus was never so caught up on what he was doing or where he was going that he missed what the Father was saying or doing. So now remember this, Jesus was fully God and fully man. He didn't cling to his rights as a sound that formed the world around him. He didn't perform miracles from his identity as a son. He laid down all of those rights. When Jesus came unto the earth in flesh, he laid down all of his, his kingly and, and rights to the throne and he performed every miracle out of right relationship with the Lord through the Holy Spirit. Why did he do that? It was because he wanted to demonstrate what your life would look like if your heart was made right and what the Holy Spirit could do through you. It was never a point to show off how godly he was was or how kingly he was. He never had to prove anything. He's fully God and fully man, and he laid down those rights so that he could be the blueprint of what your life could look like if you allow the Holy Spirit to flow through you the way that he did. He didn't come to show off. He came to, to demonstrate. Hmm. Listen to what, what it says in John 14. It says, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me do the works I have been doing and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son you may ask for anything in my name and I will do it we all believe in the, in the infallible word of God don't we? How come, the, do we believe that though when we hear that about you? We can believe the theory, but do you believe that about you? That 
that you will do greater things than even Jesus did on the earth. That's a frightening statement. He said it. So the path of the evolutionary that we're setting out on today, I make no promises to take you like three miles down the path. But what I will do is, is we'll talk about what it looks like to set out on a journey, to pursue the rights that Jesus said that he granted you. You see, when, when, when you read that, he says, greater things will you do. Ask anything in my name and I will do it. We don't surrender these rights to fail, because of failure and comfortably tuck them away into ideals because we can't square with how something turned out in our lives. And this is the hardest part of the journey is to continue on and not simply camp out at the site of our last disappointment. We can look at people we love who weren't healed and choose to look through the lens and stop pursuing our birthright. To stop believing that God wants to miraculously pour out his kingdom. Listen, I can list off so many people I know, and I don't know if this is gonna be encouraging to say, but I'm just gonna say it because I, wanna, I want you to kind of, us to get on the same level here. I have a handful of people in my life who, are, who had faith that could move mountains. These are people who traveled to different nations leading children to Jesus, saw bodies healed, saw miraculous things happen with their eyes. And they died. They did. So it would be so easy to look at this person and to say, but Lord, they were so good. Lord, they, they were so faithful. Lord, I saw them go through this whole journey and I saw that, that, that it didn't result in a miraculous healing in their body. So there's something that's been recalibrated on the inside of me to say that because of this person being so amazing and because, because you didn't choose to reveal yourself this way that, that I am choosing to kind of adopt and move around my core beliefs and values to try to facilitate a life that says maybe God really doesn't do those things. Maybe it's something for the special or something for the anointed or something for, for a different place where the Lord is really pouring out his spirit, but maybe that's not for me. And so what we do is on a subconscious level, we accept that lie and we no longer begin to press in. When we see someone sick or someone who, is, who isn't doing well in our lives, sometimes we get so comfortable in this unbelief that we don't even think about God coming in and healing them. We just say, I'll pray for you. You know, why doesn't God heal, why hasn't God healed everybody? We come to him with big heavy hearts and questions sometimes. But if you're gonna enter into doubt and questions, let me encourage you with something. He's not intimidated or threatened by those questions because he has an answer for every single one of them. And bottom line, at the end of the day, he is good and we can trust him when we don't have the answers. Right? You know, I remember, um, we've announced it prior to this, but when Jim Jacobs passed away and passed into glory, I woke up that morning and I was praying for him. I was saying, Lord, would you just heal his body? And I was just really, I was in my kitchen just really focusing in. And the only thing I could picture was the Lord showed me a mountaintop and just like Steve, the clouds parted and I saw Jim running. And you know that's a miracle for him. And I remember um, when Jim was in um, BSSM, he was in my revival group and there was this encounter moment that happened where that is exactly what he described. He saw he was just undone in the presence of the Lord. And where am I going with this? I'm just saying our perspective as a human is limited. We can only see in part this side of heaven. So if something doesn't turn out the way that we think it should or, or pan out the way that we had hoped, can we trust God when we don't understand? And can we see his perspective that maybe since our life is just a vapor on this planet when compared to eternity, maybe, maybe this is what Jesus meant and God meant when he said death had lost its sting, huh? you got a whole big old future of eternity in front of you with you and Jesus. 
But this is what Jesus did. He knew his time on earth was limited. He had 33 years to complete a heavenly plan created before the foundation of the earth. And we have a limited amount of time on this evolutionary road. So don't settle your faith on the grounds of where you didn't see a breakthrough. Because if you settle there, that's all you'll ever see. You may witness a miracle or two from those passing by you on this road, but you won't see heaven released on earth. This is where the path and moving forward becomes profoundly simple. Will we continue to believe that Jesus will do in us what he promised, and when we believe it enough to pack up and continue onward on the narrow road? Will we allow him to transform our mind through a reformation of how we think so that we can base our hopes not on like our own ideas or limited thoughts, but on his infinite power and wisdom? So I wanna do a little uh, exercise with you this morning, if that's okay. Would you close your eyes just for a second? I'm not gonna let you leave them shut long enough to drift off. I know, I'm a parent, I get it. Um, but what would you do in the kingdom? I want you to ask the Lord, what would I do if you had no worries or holdups? What would you do for him right now? Everybody's got a story popping up in your mind. Let it pop up. Would you call up that friend? Would you call that family member who's been suffering from chronic illness? Would you prophesy to that tortured soul in the cubicle next to you? Would you call to reconcile a broken relationship? Come on, let them all just pop up into your mind about what you would do if you had a million percent certainty that it was gonna, that you just said the word and it would happen. Every thought that is bubbling up in your mind right now is what is buried in the ground you're currently camping on. So to pick up and move on this road means to unearth those hopes and desires again and to carry them with you as you move forward. And let me tell you, it is so easy, it is so easy to stop moving, to become preoccupied with the immediate and lose sight of the eternal, to bury things that we don't have answers for and hope something good passes us by. But let me tell you, there's still adventure in your bones. And there is still hope. And God is still stirring things inside of you. And that invitation is still open. You can still become a revolutionary. So you've picked yourself up. You can open your eyes. You're picking yourself up on this road. All of those things that you have buried in your ground, you are picking up on the campsite. You're no longer going to be camped out at the site of your last disappointment where you decided that this is where things are. And I've just accepted things as, as status quo. You've picked yourself up and you're peering around the corner and there's alignment of your faith with Jesus at the center. So this is uh, the beauty, the ground that you've left now, we talked about this last time I was here, is now a monument. The power of testimony is released every time you look back because you can say, this is where I used to live. I don't live there anymore. So doubt or fear, I've been healed. I don't live there anymore. You suffer with complacency, I don't live there anymore. Disappointment and regret, I don't live there anymore. You can say it over whatever you're leaving right now. So I want you to picture those things, gather them up, gather all those thoughts, the things that were holding you back. I want you to kind of identify the place that you were at when, when, when faith became something that wasn't as active and something that was inhibited by um, the, something that happened to you or some disappointment. Picture it. And I want you, as you're picking up that stuff and taking a step forward, I want you to say, I don't live there anymore if you want it to be released in your life. So go ahead and say it with me. I don't live there anymore. Come on, picture it again and say it again. I don't live there anymore. One more time. I don't live there anymore. You guys are powerful. I get blasted by you. <laughs> I can only imagine what your father thinks of you. If I feel that, what does he think about you? While you make him proud. Every single one of you sitting here today, you make the father so proud. loves you. So now what? You've 
picked up all that stuff that was buried in the ground and we're moving forward on the road. Well, now we strive to enter his race, rest, the race, and follow his pace. So we have to be, this is Hebrews 4. It says we must be extremely careful to ensure that we all embrace the fullness of that power and not fail to experience it. For we've heard the good news of deliverance just as they did, yet they didn't join with the faith of the word. Footnote for that, he's talking about Old Covenant, Joshua, Caleb, Moses. Instead, what they heard didn't affect them deeply for they doubted. For those of us who believe, faith activates the promise and we experience the realm of confident rest. Hmm. His pace, you see, this is the rhythm we're trying to emulate. Too often, we try to make God-sized space in the middle of our unrealistic to-do lists and expect him to speak to us for the fullness and richness of that message to saturate our bones faster than three tea bags and a little mug. But we're not, love has its own pace. He has his own pace and he can't be rushed. Let me just, I'm running out of time with you. Oh yeah, I'm out of time. Hallelujah. Happens every time. <laughs> oh. Okay. Let me take you on two, two, two more little caveats and we'll, we'll come in for landing, Okay. Do I have any songwriters or creatives in the room today? Anybody? First off, Father, keep your hands up. Keep them up. I want to see who you are so I can hunt you down after service. But also, Lord, I just pray that you would, God, stir the creative ideas in them, Lord. Lord, help them to steward what you're saying. Help them to see. So, songwriting. Lyrics aren't always going to obediently land quickly into an easy format. The ideas in your subconscious are where the beauty of, of the lyrics come from. People think that like when people write a song that it just kind of bubbles out and it's amazing. They must be so talented, but the truth is they've just connected with, with their spirit. They've connected with their soul and they can articulate, they can articulate what's happening on the, in their subconscious. I read a book on songwriting and it said that every piece of content and lyrics that you need is in there. It's like an ocean that you're diving into, grabbing a shell and bringing it up to the sunlight because nobody else will see from your perspective. Nobody else has your unique combined experiences to create this piece of beauty that you're showing to the world, right? But it doesn't always happen easy. Sometimes we're inspired and sometimes that we're not. Sometimes we write amazing material when we are totally uninspired and we are totally inspired and the song hurts to listen to. So music is a language that's similar to that of the spirit. Sometimes we can feel and understand something expressed in music that words cannot. And sometimes creating doesn't feel like creating. It feels like discovery. And sometimes we have to entertain a million ideas before that last layer is removed. And that lyric that was under it all, all those bad ideas, surfaces, it takes its place in a spot that feels like it wouldn't fit anywhere else. God's like that. He won't be rushed. You can't make him do things on your timetable. He exists apart from time. It says in Matthew 11, 28 through 30, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you will recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me, work with me, watch how I do it. And my favorite line, Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Did you hear that? Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Once you discover your place, it's like Mary and Martha. Do you remember that story in the Bible where Martha was bustling around and Mary was seated at the feet of Jesus, and she got all upset, but Jesus told her, Mary has discovered what's the most important and it won't be taken away from her. So once you discover your place at the feet of Jesus and you learn the rhythms of his walk, it will not be taken away from you. You've picked up and 
began the journey down the evolutionary road following the pace of Jesus. And I'll close with this. It's a path that as you journey further, the more of him you pick up and the less of you is carried. John the Baptist said this. You know, a bunch of people came up to John the Baptist when Jesus started his ministry and they were like, what do you think about Jesus' ministry? I don't know why they sound like Hydro Thunder. Hydro Thunder. <laughs> what do you think about Jesus' ministry? It's so much bigger than yours. And how many of you guys would ever like expect a pastor if someone came, came in and said, hey guys, I know Bethel Cleveland's amazing, but you should see this other church. It's amazing. It's so huge. What would you say? You'd be like, yeah, that's, that, that's great. Happy for you. John the Baptist said, he must increase so that I might decrease. There's a beauty of surrender that happens when we travel down this road. And the beauty of it is that our inferior motives become rooted out. And we no longer need to achieve something to affirm us. Because once we've captured the revelation that Jesus has affirmed us, that every other motivation, every other reason for pursuing this road, you see, because there's a lot of opportunity in, in ministry, there's a lot of opportunity when following God to allow the mighty and amazing things you do for him to somehow validate you. But let me tell you something. Jesus said there will be people who stand before him one day who said, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons. And he would say, I didn't know you. So you can do amazing, amazing things. But if you're missing the one. But that's the beauty of this road that we're on with Jesus is that the further we go, the more we, we hear his voice more affirmed by him. And we no longer need to be validated by what ministry can offer us or by what, what we feel like the world can offer us. We aren't trying to pick up a collection of things to make an argument for why we're worthwhile. But we, we're affirmed by our Father. And so that is all we need. So we drop all the inferior motives and all of a sudden you're not laden down with all of this baggage anymore that's holding you back. You're not carrying heaviness anymore and disappointment. You're not wearing lies as labels anymore in your life. And you're able to abandon all of those heavy, ill-fitting things and walk forward into the destiny and the life that Jesus paid for you to have. All the, all the other junk just gets left behind. And that means we stop carrying it all and we learn to travel light. And this is what I mean, then I'm gonna pray for you. Traveling light means I can move quickly when he speaks. I can sprint forward on this road with confidence when he asks because I'm not bogged down anymore by the lies or the curses of the enemy. I had a dream last night. This is it, I promise. 18th close. The Lord spoke to me about curses that people have spoken over, over others' lives. Let me read you a few examples of some real, real life curses that people have said to me, okay? My favorite, not my favorite, but you know. <laughs> I say favorites now because I don't live under them, but you know. <laughs> you're, you're a small business in the middle of nowhere going nowhere. Here's, you guys might laugh at this one. I don't, I don't see you ever writing songs. I see you just leading worship and singing covers. Oh, this was one from when I was younger. I don't see you as a pastor. You don't connect with people very well. For all my audio people in the room, your voice is impossible to mix. Maybe still true. <laughs> It says, you're, you're probably not meant to be in ministry. These are a couple of mine, and they, they, the memory of them stings. I, I, know, I know that's hard to word, you know what I mean? But you can still feel, I, I, I remember how it felt. It doesn't feel up close anymore. But they sting to hear, why? Because there's a pull, like an accusation that makes us feel like these pronouncements are trying to hold us down or get us to agree. They have the air of something that's trying to control how you see yourself, right? And this is one of the enemy's favorite tactics because he knows he doesn't have to fight you hard if you just believe what he says. He knows that if you discover that every curse is broken through Jesus, you'll see that the path in front of you is open. 
And this is what I woke up. I wrote it in my phone. It said, a curse is a perversion of the transformative power of God's word. Because God's word creates. And you know, the enemy has no power to create anything. He can't create anything. All he can do is pervert. He has no creative ability. That felt good to say. A curse attempts to subvert the outcome of a God-decreed reality. So curses are cast and then empowered by agreement. But the agreement is broken when we align with our identity and with our Father. So, you know, that was that phrase, I'm in the middle of nowhere, going nowhere. Yeah, that was absolutely true. But I serve someone who becomes the somewhere when he walks into the room. Um, you may not see me writing songs, but I'll write them in mop sink buckets while I'm cleaning bathrooms. God is looking for people who are gonna steward his word. And if you were gonna give a message to someone, would you give it to someone who barely listens to you? Or would you, would you li- give it to somebody who travels with a voice memo and notes ready the moment you speak? That's how we wanna be, right? If the Lord wants to entrust us with a message, it means I wanna be connected in this moment. So what did we talk about today? We talked about discovering the path of the love evolutionary, right? We, and we, just, we talked about not camping out at our, at our greatest disappointment, but allowing the Lord to define our faith in the motion that we take moving forward on this path. We talked about, we talked about picking up all of those things and learning his pace and entering into his rest. And now here we are, ready to travel light, breaking off curses like it's our job. So would you stand up on your feet with me this morning? And I'm gonna pray for you. But I do wanna say that he is the prize. He is the one worthy of being our one thing. He is what makes the journey worth it. Not just his benefits, but he himself, he is the prize. And Jesus said in Matthew 16, it's not a popular verse, I don't hear this a lot. Um, when I travel around, it says, if you truly want to follow me, you should at once completely reject and disown your life. And you must be willing to share my cross and experience it as your own as you continually surrender to my ways. This morning, I felt like there was an open call to step into a life of radical worship and radical devotion. So why don't you close your eyes? And I just wanna invite you today, if you are not in relationship with Jesus, if you don't know him, if you are separated from him, I felt like the Lord said he also wanted to just open eyes this morning to be able to see the truth, to not just say, well, I did pray that prayer that one time, or I, or I did say that I was a Christian, I do like to go to church, but I feel like the Lord was saying to open up the eyes and say that, not to condemn, to say that you don't know him, but to say that you could know him at a greater level than you've, you've experienced at this point. There is more for you. So if you you want to give your heart to Jesus today, if you'd like to take it, take part in, in the sacrifice of Jesus and his resurrection and enter into the kingdom and have a life that's exploding with it, exploding with adventure and experiencing the ecstasy of his presence and connecting with Jesus and knowing God, then today's your day. So if that's you, I want you to put your hand over your heart and I'm going to pray for you. Typically, we like to do a hand raise, and I like that as an activation, but I want this to be real. I want it to be more personal. A lot of people I talk to, sometimes they get too scared to raise their hand, but they go in their car and they pray, and they're changed forever. You don't care where you do it. So, Father, I invite you into my life. Jesus, give me eyes to see that one day, and it is a very real day, I will stand before you. I will stand before your throne not theoretical, in person. And I'll look on you in your glory and your splendor. And the only thing I want, I want to hear, I want you to know, is I want you to have known me and that I know you. So Lord, I thank you that you made the path for that to be possible. So I surrender my life. I ask that you would forgive me of my sins. I repent. I thank you that the Holy Spirit even now is helping me to have the grace to repent and to change the way that I think and live. And Lord, that the rest of my days would be lived and surrender at the beautiful feet of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Text that, your name and email to that number. Come up and meet our ministry team. But last prayer, and then we'll get you out of here. I'm so sorry that it's been uh, a little bit of a longer one. 
But why don't you put your right hand up? I'm gonna bless you. Bethel Cleveland, in the name of Jesus, I bless you to go out of this place that you'd pick up all of your stuff. I bless you to no longer camp out at the site of your last disappointment, but the Lord has said you don't live there anymore and that your future is bright and expansive and full of miracles and breakthrough. God, I thank you that our own um, beliefs about ourselves aren't even powerful enough to limit you. So I bless you, Bethel Cleveland, to have the full revelation of who you belong to and what, what you are called to be and what the Lord has put inside of you. I bless you to go out of this place and sprint down this revolutionary road right next to Jesus, laughing, smiling, and enjoying him every step of the way. In Jesus' name, amen.